the effects of sinful fear. Having viewed in the former chapters the types and causes of fear, and having examined what lies at the root of slavish fear, what breeds and feeds it, we now turn to the deplorable effects of such fear. Our consideration of its fruit will motivate us to apply ourselves most earnestly to the directions that are found later in this book. Effect 1. Distraction The first defect of the sinful passion is distraction of mind and duty. Both Cicero, a Roman philosopher, and Quintilian, a Roman rhetorician, maintain that the Latin word tumultus or tumult consists of timor, fear, and multus, much. Much fear creates great tumult in the soul. It puts everything into hurries and distractions to such an extent that we cannot perform any service for God with profit or comfort. The following request is a much-needed mercy, quote, that we, being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Luke 1, verse 74. It is impossible to serve God without distractions until we can serve him without the slavish fear of enemies. The reverential fear of God is the greatest spur to duty and a best help in it. But the distracting fear of enemies will divert us from our duty, thereby destroying its comfort and benefit. The devil's hindrance of comfortable fellowship with God is a deadly snare. It is remarkable that when the Apostle advises the Corinthians about marriage in times of persecution, he commends a single life. He does so for this reason, that they might attend upon the Lord without distraction. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. He knows what straits, cares, and fears unavoidably distract those who are encumbered with families and relations in such times. People should be asking, what should I do to resolve my fears and doubts concerning my interest in Christ? How should I behave in suffering so as to credit religion and not become a scandal and stumbling block to others? Instead, their thoughts are occupied with other cares and fears. What will become of my wife and my little ones? What will I do to secure them from danger? I do not doubt that it is one of the devil's great designs to keep us in continual fear and alarm, and to puzzle our heads and hearts with a thousand difficulties which will probably never come upon us, and even if they do, they will never prove as fatal as we imagine. He does this to unfit us for present duties and to destroy our comfort in them, if he can distract our thought through fears and terrors. He gained three advantages to our unspeakable loss. First, he severs us from the freedom and sweetness of communion with God in our duties. The best duties become an empty shell when this worm eats away at them. Prayer, as John of Damascus expresses it, is the ascension of the mind or soul to God, but distraction clips its wings. Whoever lacks possession of a thought never offers up his soul to God. The life of communion with God in prayer consists in the harmony that is between our hearts and words, and both with God's will. Distraction spoils this harmony. Second, Satan severs the soul from the support and relief it should draw from God's promises. When the Israelites were in bondage, their minds were distracted with fears and sorrows. They did not regard Moses' supporting promises of deliverance, Exodus 6, verse 6. David received a particular promise of the kingdom from God's mouth. It included his deliverance from Saul's hand, all his attempts to destroy him. Even so, when he faced imminent hazards, he was afraid. That fear undermined the support he should have derived from the promise to such an extent that he declared, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. 1 Samuel 27 verse 1 He also declared, all men are liars, Psalm 116, verse 11. That included Samuel, who had assured David of the kingdom. This is always the nature of fear. It makes people distrust the best security when they are in imminent peril. What a mischief it is to make us suspicious of those promises that our chief relief and support in times of trouble are. Our fears will render us unfit for prayer. 
They so also shake the credit of the promises. The damage to us is so great that it would be better to lose our two eyes than to lose such an advantage is in trouble. Third, Satan severs us from the comfort that is found in our past experiences and a relief that God's faithfulness and goodness imparted in former straits and dangers. Fear clouds them all, Isaiah 51, verses 12 and 13. We give so much attention to people in dangers that we forget God, even the God who preserved us when the enemy was ready to devour us. Our distracting fears cut us off from all these sweet reliefs when we need them most. Effect number two of sinful fear, deception. Deception is also the fruit of slavish fear. Distraction is bad enough, but deceit is even worse. Yet, as bad as it is, fear drives good people into this snare. It makes an upright soul warp and bend from those rules of integrity which should be inseparable from a Christian. God says to Israel, and of whom hast thou been afraid or feared, that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me, nor laid it to your heart? Isaiah 57, 11. God blames fear for their falsehood. It was against the resolution of their hearts to waver. Who has scared you into this evil? Abraham's fear made him waver at the reproach of his religion. Genesis 20, verses 2 and 11. It was an odd sight to see a heathen reprove great Abraham. Fear drew his son Isaac into the same snare, Genesis 26, verse 7. Despite Christ's promise, fear caused Peter to say, I do not know the man, Matthew 26, verse 72. Abraham should have remembered what the Lord had said to him. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, Genesis 15, verse 1. If he had, he would have escaped both the sin and the shame into which he fell. Yet, Fear was even able to foil this great believer. Certainly, this is a great evil, complicated mischief. It dishonors God. Through these falls and scandals, religion is made vile and contemptible in the world's eyes. It brings much reproach upon God and his promises, as if his word were insufficient security in times of trouble, as if it were safer to sin than to trust his promises. Number two, it weakens other believers. It is a sore discouragement in times of trial to see our brothers faint for fear, to see them ashamed to hold to their own principles. Satan and wicked people always use it to this purpose. And number three, it wounds a conscience. Such flaws in integrity will keep us awake at night. Oh, the mischief caused by a faint and fearful spirit. Effect number three of sinful fear. Vulnerability. Slavish fear strengthens temptation in times of danger and makes it very prevalent and influential. The fear of man brings a snare, Proverbs 29, verse 25. Satan spreads a net, but we are not within its reach until our own fear drives us into it. The soul's recoiling from imminent danger might cause a true Christian's pulse to falter, no matter how regular it beats at other times. It causes great trepidation and timidity in people who are sincere and upright. It brings a snare over their souls. Aaron was a good man, and he knew idolatry was a great sin. Yet fear prevailed upon him to such an extent that he gave way to that great evil. Thou knowest a people that they are set on mischief. Exodus 32, verse 22. In other words, Lord, I had no choice. The people were violently and passionately set upon it. If I had resisted them, it would have cost me dearly. Fear prevailed upon origin to yield an offering incense to idols. Fear made David play the fool and act so dishonorably, 1 Samuel 21, verses 12 to 15. Fear is Satan's snare. It has got as many souls as in any other snare. It'd be easy to give many a sad example, but it would make this chapter too long. Instead, I will give a few particulars concerning this snare's danger. Fear first drives people out of their proper station, out of their place and duty, into Satan's ground. 
The subtle enemy of our salvation knows that we are out of gunshot range when we abide with God in the way of our duty. The Lord is with us while we are with him. Satan cannot attempt to ruin us while we are under the wings of God's protection. To do anything to us, he must first force us out from under those wings. Nothing does this more effectively than fear. When we move from that shelter, we are like birds wandering from their nest. Proverbs 27, verse 8. Second, fear is usually the first passion to seek peace with the enemy. It approaches the tempter about terms of surrender. As a French proverb says, the castle that parlays is half won. Fear consults with flesh and blood while faith engages with God to supply strength to endure the siege. We have a sad instance of this in Mr. Bacon's account of Francis Spira, a lawyer who renounced his commitment to Luther's cause. His fears caused him to parley with the tempter, while Spira tossed upon the restless waves of doubt. Without guide to trust or haven to flee for help, God's Spirit suddenly assisted him. He felt calm and began to converse with himself in this manner. Why do you wander in uncertainty? Unhappy man, cast away fear, put on your shield of faith. Where is your courage, goodness, and constancy? Remember that Christ's glory lies at the stake. Suffer therefore without fear, he will defend you. He will tell you how to answer. He can beat back all danger, bring you out of prison, and raise you from the dead. Consider Peter in the dungeon and the martyrs in the fire. Francis Spira was quiet and resolved to follow those weighty reasons. However, thinking it wise to examine all things, he consulted flesh and blood. As a result, the battle resumed. Flesh spoke as follows. Be well advised. Consider reasons on both sides and judge. How can you overvalue your own sufficiency? You neither regard the examples of your forefathers nor the judgment of the whole church. Do you not consider what misery this rashness will cause you? You will lose all your substance obtained with so much care and travail. You will undergo the most exquisite torments that Malink can devise. You will be viewed as a heretic. On top of everything, you will die shamefully. What do you think of the stinking dungeon, the bloody axe, and the burning faggot? Are they delightful? Through fear, Francis Spira parleyed with the tempter consulted with flesh and blood, and at last fainted and yielded. Third, fear makes people impatient while waiting for God's time and method of deliverance. It discourages the soul and drives it into the next temptation snare. The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in a pit, Isaiah 51, verse 14. According to fear, any means of escape is better than lying in a pit. When fear influences the soul, it becomes easy prey to the next temptation. Effect number four, a sinful fear, cowardice. Fear naturally produces cowardice in people, a poor, low spirit that faints and yields upon every slight assault. Wherever it prevails, it extinguishes Christian courage and strength. In the scriptures, it is frequently joined with discouragement. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Deuteronomy 1 verse 21. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. Deuteronomy 20 verse 3. It is also coupled with dismay. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. And a faint heart. Isaiah 7 verse 4. These are the effects and consequences of sinful fear. How dangerous it is to have courage extinguished and faintness of heart strengthened when we have great need of courage. Our peace, perseverance, and eternal happiness depend so much upon it. It is said to us and dishonorable to religion when we have the hearts of women, Isaiah 19, verse 16, instead of a man, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. In all ages, we discovered that those who manifest most courage for Christ in times of trouble are those whose faith surmounts fear and whose hearts are above the world's discouragements. Basel, Bishop of Caesarea, was such a man. This appears in his answer to Emperor Valens, who tempted him with offers of promotion. Offer thee things to children. When Valens threatened him with grievous suffering, he replied, 
threatening things to your purple gallants, who give themselves to pleasure and are afraid to die. This spirit of courage and strength was prevalent among the primitive Christians. They did not fear the face of tyrants. They did not shrink from the cruelest torments. Their courage was a credit to Christianity. One of Julian's nobles, present to the torture of Marcus, bishop of Arethusa, declared, We are ashamed, O emperor. The Christians laugh at your cruelty and grow more resolute by it. Lactantius, an early Christian author, also testifies, Our women and children, not to speak of our men, overcome their torments. The fire cannot fetch so much as a sigh from them. If carnal fear is ascendant over us, her courage and resolution melt away. When this happens, we might still suffer out of unavoidable necessity, but we will never suffer in a manner that honors Christ and religion. Effective sinful fear number five, apostasy from the gospel. Carnal fear is a root of apostasy. It has caused thousands of professors to faint and fall away in the hour of temptation. It is not so much our enemy's fury without as our own fears within that make temptations victorious over us. Christ states the beginning of apostasy from the beginning of fear. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10. When troubles and dangers come to a height, fear begins to work at a height. 2. The critical hours when fear is high and faith is low. Temptation is strong and resistance is weak. Satan knocks at the door and fears open it, yielding up the soul to him, unless special assistance arise from heaven. As long as we can profess religion without any great hazard to life, liberty, or estate, we show much zeal in the way of godliness. But when it comes to resisting unto blood, few will assert it openly. The first retreat is usually made from a free and an open to a close and concealed practice of religion. We fail to open our windows to show that we do not care who knows we worship God, Daniel 6 verse 10. Instead, we hide our principles and practices with all the art and care imaginable. We seek to escape danger by letting go of our profession. If the inquest continues and this refuge can no longer protect us, then we give some open sign of compliance with false worship. We do it in order to avoid being marked out for ruin. Then fear says, give a little more ground and retreat to the next security. We comply externally with what we know is forbidden, hoping God will be merciful to us as long as we keep our hearts for him. In reference to worshiping the Roman god, Seneca advises, quote, let us make an appearance of worshiping them, though our hearts give no religious respect to them, end quote. If the temptation hunts us even further, putting us to a more difficult test and threatening us with deaths, and the loss of all that is dear in the life, we subscribe to contrary articles and renounce our avowed principles. Nothing in the world hazards our eternal salvation as our fear. It is a rock upon which we will make a horrible shipwreck both of truth and peace. This is the case of Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury. His fear caused him to go against his own conscience by betraying the known truth. Indeed, there is no temptation in the world that overthrows so many as that which is backed with fear. The love of honor is slain at thousands, but fear sufferings is ten thousands. Effect number six of sinful fear, bondage. Sinful fear places people under great bondage of spirit and makes death a thousand times more terrible and intolerable. We read of some who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, Hebrews 2, verse 15. This means that fear kept them in miserable anxiety and perplexity of mind, like slaves that tremble at the whip, which is held over them. Many people lived like that, under the lash. The name of death is so terrible, especially a violent death, that they cannot bear to hear it mentioned. Such fear gave rise to the saying, It is better to die once than to be always dying. Surely a trembling life is the most miserable life that can be lived. Why? 
First, it destroys all of life's comforts and pleasures. No pleasure can thrive under the shadow of this cursed plant. It embitters the comforts we possess in this world. It is said that Democles, an Athenian orator, told Dionysius, a tyrant, that his wealth, power, and majesty made him the happiest man in the world. Dionysius set a flatterer at a table furnished with all dainties. However, he also set a sharp sword hanging by a single horsehair over his head. This caused Domocles to tremble so much that he could neither eat nor drink. He longed to run from the danger. Dionysius's design was to convince Democles that those who live under the continual terror of impending death are miserable. God threatened his people with terrible judgment. Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a the wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Every one that goes out then shall be torn in pieces. Jeremiah 5, verses 6 and 7. What a miserable life. They could not leave the city without being seized by lions, wolves, and leopards, which lurked everywhere. Yet even that is more tolerable than for a person's fear to afflict him continually. Second, a trembling life destroys the spiritual comforts that flow from God's promises. It also destroys our experience of the promises, the sweetest pleasure we have in this world. As no creature comfort is pleasant, so no promise is sweet to the person living in bondage to fear. And the terrors of death are great, the comforts of the Almighty are small. In a written word, there are all sorts of refreshing, strengthening, and heart-reviving promises. By his care and wisdom, God prepared these for our relief in days of darkness and trouble. There are promises of support under the heaviest burdens and pressures. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. Yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, verse 10. This promise is able to make the trembling soul shout with the joy of men in harvest, or men who divide the spoil. There are also promises of protection, Isaiah 27, verses 2 and 3, Isaiah 33, verse 2. In times of danger, these lead us to God's almighty power, placing us under the wings of his care. There are promises of moderation. They enable us to bear the day of sharp affliction, Isaiah 27, verse 8. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There are promises of deliverance. If our enemy's malice brings us into trouble, God's mercy will assuredly bring us out. Psalm 91, verses 14 and 15. Psalm 125, verse 3. There are promises to bless and sanctify our troubles for our good. Our troubles not only cease to be hurtful, but they become exceedingly beneficial. Isaiah 27, verse 9. Romans 8, verse 28. These are the most comfortable promises of all. Our tender Father provides all these promises for the day of fear and trouble, because He knows our weakness and how our fear makes us doubt our security. He engages us wisdom, power, care, faithfulness, and unchangeableness for the performance of His promises. In the midst of such sale promises, how cheerful should we be in the worst times? Which to say is David, Wherefore should I fear in the day of evil? Psalm 49, verse 5. Let those who have no God to whom they can turn, no promise upon which they can rely, fear in the day of evil. You have very much cause to do so. Yet our fear beats us away from this most comfortable refuge in the promises. We are so scared that we ignore them and fail to draw encouragement, resolution, and courage from them. In this way, the shields of the mighty are cast away. By a singular providence, aiming at our relief in future distress, God has preserved all the choice records of the saints' experiences in trouble and distress. If danger threatens us, we may turn to the recorded experiences of his people, the mighty influence of his providence upon their enemies' hearts, whereby they show them favor. Genesis 31, verse 29. Jeremiah 15, verse 11. There are also the ancient rolls and records of the admirable methods of his people's deliverance. His infinite and unsearchable wisdom contrived these when their thoughts were at a loss. Exodus 15, verse 6. 2 Kings 19, verse 3. 
There are the recorded experiences of God's unspotted faithfulness, which never failed anyone who dared to trust in him, Joshua 7, verse 9, Micah 6, verses 4 and 5. There are also the records of his tender fatherly care for his children, for his peculiar treasure in times of danger, Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, Deuteronomy 12, verse 2, Psalm 40, verse 7, Isaiah 49, verse 16. All these and many additional helps and supports are made available to us in the day of trouble. At what purpose did they serve? If our fear affects us to such an extent that we cannot apply them nor calmly consider them. Third, a trembling life deprives us of the manifold advantages that arise from a calm and a composed meditation upon death. If we could sit down in peace, meditate in a familiar way upon death, and look with a composed mind into our graves without being frightened with the thoughts of death. What a change would it make upon us? What seriousness would those meditations produce in us? What abundance of people would they prevent on our lives? The sprinkling of dust upon new writing prevents blots and blurs in our books or letters. If we could sprinkle the dust of the grave upon our minds, it would prevent many sins and miscarriages in our words and actions. But promises, experiences, and even death have no profit or advantage when fear puts a soul into a state of confusion. And thus you see some of sinful fear's mischievous effects.